שבוע טוב, חג סוכות שמח, מועדים לשמחה. I'm Rolene Marks, this is the Israel Brief, brought to you every Monday to Thursday by Lay of the Land. And just before we get into those top stories, because you know we like to meet every Monday to Thursday to take a look at those top stories dominating the headlines in Israel. You guys know it, the ones that you won't see in the mainstream media in your country. But just as well, because we have formed a phenomenal global community. So just before we get into those headlines, a little bit of housekeeping. This week, there will only be Israel briefs from Monday to Wednesday. Wednesday night marks the end of Sukkot and the beginning of Shemini. Yatzeret and Simchat Torah. Now, as you recall, some 380 something days ago on the 7th of October, it was Simchat Torah, and this year we will mark Simchat Torah also with a day of mourning. However, today is day 381 since that horrific day which sparked a, a war against Hamas and a war in the north, and, and, and actually wars on multiple fronts. Now, there are still 101 hostages that remain in Hamas captivity. We want them home now. And what are our chances? Well, that is connected to today's top story. And that is the phenomenal news that broke on Thursday that the IDF had eliminated Israel's most wanted man, Yechir Sinwa, responsible for, the, for being the mastermind and the, the, the leader of Hamas that created the conditions and planned the 7th of October attacks, which saw over 1,200 people slaughtered, raped, mutilated, families burnt alive, people beheaded, and over 251 taken captive into the Gaza Strip. What many people don't realize is that amongst the remaining 101 hostages, there are not just Israelis or Jews, there are Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists from 20 plus different countries, and we want them back. So let's take a look at what actually happened. So on Thursday, we got the extraordinary news that uh, there had been an airstrike in the Gaza Strip and that the uh, army and, and the forensic experts were examining to see whether or not the body found belonged to Yehia Sinwa. Now, many of us saw the photos that circulated very quickly on social media, and it looked to be Sinwa. The ears were the same, his very distinctive teeth were the same, but of course we have to make absolutely sure and uh, he first was identified by his, uh, his uh, orthodontics and then by DNA. And the response from Israelis has been actually quite fascinating. As, as happy as we are that the arch-terrorist, the, the, this generation's Hitler, had been eliminated, we are also very aware that unlike Nasrallah, there are still 101 hostages and we are holding off on the celebrations until those 101 return home. So what happened? What we understand is that in the Tel al-Sultan uh, area, which is very, very deep inside Gaza in the south of Rafiach, you guys will remember Rafiach, where world leaders, including Vice President Kamala Harris, warned Israel not to enter. Well, not only did we discover over a hundred uh, terrorist tunnels going into Egypt, but we also discovered the bodies of six hostages, more about that later in Rafiach, in a tunnel very, very deep underground. And now this is where Sinwa put up his last stand. What we do know is that uh, troops from the Bislamach patrol, uh, and they are not even a special unit. These are uh, guys that are part of the, the training school that are also war proficient. We're carrying out a routine patrol, saw several, uh, saw several blah, blah, put my teeth back in, saw several terrorists engaged in um, uh, an exchange of fire. Those terrorists were killed and they saw one run into a building. The uh, tank unit fired a shell. 
The soldiers then sent in a drone to check if anyone was uh, still alive, which is very, very interesting, and, and people must note this. First of all, we send in drones, we double check that there are no civilians around, and, and we check to see uh, whether or not there are people alive or dead. And, and what the drone footage actually shows you is a man with a part of his arm missing, his face covered, sitting in an, an armchair. And when the, he sees the drone, he throws a stick at it. And uh, he was taken out uh, with a shot to the head. This has been confirmed by the forensic pathologist, Dr. Kugel. And uh, a, another shell was fired into the building and his remains were found. And, and the soldiers who actually found him said, you know, he looks a lot like Senwa, but they, they couldn't quite believe it, reported it into their commanders, uh, who, who then asked for a, a finger that was taken for DNA confirmation. Remember, Israel has Sinwa's DNA on record because he spent 20 years in an Israeli jail and it was confirmed that it was indeed the most wanted man in Israel, Yehia Sinwa, finally eliminated. Now, uh, what is also interesting that, we, and, and we have seen a lot of the, the footage that the IDF have gained from intelligence, and you could see on the 6th of October, Sinwa and his family, his wife carrying a Hermes Birkin bag, those are about 32,000, dollars per bag through the tunnels, living in the absolute lap of luxury underground. Interestingly, in his uh, luxury tunnel situation, you could see millions of dollars and shekels in money, as well as aid with uh, clear UNRWA markings on. And he was also found, uh, when his pockets were emptied, he was found with several thousand dollars in cash fake passport, a little roll of Mentos, quite funny because it says I love Israel on them. And uh, a fake uh, ID card was also found very close to him, that of an UNRWA worker. It is believed that Sinwa was trying to flee from the Gaza Strip inside Egypt. Now, I mentioned at the, at the beginning about the six hostages who were found in Rafiah. Well, it is believed that Sinwa was using the six hostages who were executed on the, on the 31st of August, Hirsch, Ori, Alex, Almog, Carmel, and Eden, and, and Eden rather, as human shields, and, and perhaps executed them in order to make his, his getaway. Well, as you can uh, believe, the response of world leaders has been uh, quite jubilant, saying they will not mourn uh, Sinwa and that we now actually have uh, a better chance at getting our hostages back and a better chance at uh, a future between Israelis and Palestinians. Immediately afterwards, the Prime Minister dispatched the head of the Shabak, Ronin Bar, to Cairo to start hostage negotiations. It is believed that this is our window of opportunity. In his address to the nation later that evening, Prime Minister Netanyahu offered Gazans immunity if they handed hostages over. He says, you, you can end this war tomorrow, hand over our hostages, all of them, and surrender, and the war ends tomorrow. Don't do that, and the war continues. Now, Daniel Birnbaum, the former CEO of SodaStream, many of you are familiar with uh, SodaStream, he has offered anyone in Gaza who turns in a hostage alive $100,000. The offer is open until Wednesday evening. So far, there haven't been any takers, but uh, many of you are, are, are people of faith. I'm a person of, of, of faith and spirituality. What we find absolutely astonishing and can only come from above is that Sinwa, who initiated the horrific attacks of the 7th of October on the last day of Sukkot, was eliminated on the first day of Sukkot. And that he had to go to the same forensic pathologist as all his victims did. And he was identified in the same way as all his victims were identified. And on the 7th of October, that same unit 
that same tank unit where tanks were attacked and, and the soldiers inside were either slaughtered or whose bodies were taken hostage, they were the ones who fired that tank shell. It is absolutely extraordinary. He wasn't killed by special forces. He was killed by, by regular infantry. And, and we salute these phenomenal, phenomenal soldiers. So that's a little bit of the spiritual element. And uh, to date, his body has been held in a secret place. And we don't know uh, any more details whether or not it will be used in negotiations, which has been recommended by many. So those are the updates around Sinwa. We can finally breathe. The butcher of Khan Yunus called that because he had butchered and tortured many, many Palestinians even before he got to Israelis before the 7th of October. On Saturday, a drone was, uh, fired from Lebanon by Hezbollah uh, attacked the private residence of Prime Minister Netanyahu. The Prime Minister and his wife were not home at the time, but uh, eyewitnesses around Kassaria, where he lives, reported hearing a loud, very, very scary bang. In a statement later that day, the Prime Minister said that whoever had tried to assassinate him and his wife had made a grave mistake and that they will pay a heavy price. It is believed that this came from Tehran, orders came from Tehran, from the Iranians, perhaps in reprisal to the eliminations of several um, key terrorists like Nasrallah and like Sinwa. But uh, a member of the security cabinet, Gidon Saar, said yesterday in a tweet that he believes that uh, Lebanon should be held responsible, that that came from a sovereign state. And whether or not there will be a reprisal attack for an attempt of an assassination on our prime minister that hasn't been uh, confirmed or denied in the press. In fact, no comment has been made about that. While we're on the subject of reprisal attacks, in an astonishing story that broke over the weekend, it was reported that a major leak of several documents believed to contain possible plans to uh, conduct a reprisal attack against Iran for the massive missile attack on the 1st of October was leaked. This was reported in a pro-Iranian uh, publication called the Middle East Spectator, Spectator, and they are believed to have obtained these documents from somebody in U.S. intelligence. Now, the U.S. House Speaker has vowed that an immediate investigation into the possibility or how these documents could have possibly leaked got out there, and of course, we will keep you updated on this. And while we've been focusing south, let's not forget about the north and the IDF announced that they will be targeting financial institutions or at least the um, uh, financial arms that supply the money to Hezbollah. Now, earlier today, reports came of uh, several strikes on buildings in the southern Beirut suburb of Dahir. That is believed to be the Hezbollah stronghold. We know that the IAF struck several targets there. Last night, the IDF chief spokesperson, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, said that in the coming days they will uh, make public how NGOs, national institutions, associations and others are used as a front to funnel the funds for terror. And while we're on the subject of Hezbollah, a former UN peacekeeper has spoken to a Danish daily newspaper and he has said the following. He has said, we were totally subject to Hezbollah. We clearly had limited freedom of movement. For example, we never operated after dark for fear of Hezbollah. So they had free time in the evening and night hours. He also reported that UNIFIL and UNTSO workers had their access to cities in southern Lebanon restricted by Hezbollah who would stop them when they tried to enter certain areas. They simply blocked the road. They were not visibly armed but aggressive and it was quite clear they were members of Hezbollah. We knew very well who decided things, especially in the Shiite cities. They didn't want us to see what they 
were doing. Now, of course, Unifil has come under a lot of criticism for seemingly turning a blind eye to Hezbollah's uh, tunnel um, uh, structures and situations and launching of attacks on Israeli sovereign territory from the south of Lebanon. Right, let's get to your favorite part of the show, and it's the audience question. And I was a very naughty girl on Thursday because I forgot to, to mention our question of the day. So today we have two questions. The first one comes from Valerie Chambers, who asks, Raleen, what happens to all the munitions, all the weapons that the IDF confiscates? Great question, Valerie. So I'll tell you the answer. A lot of it is taken um, into custody. Uh, I have seen some of the evidence myself from that that we, we have gathered from uh, Hamas in Gaza and in the, the south of Israel. A lot of it is taken into to evidence for exhibitions, uh, to show diplomats, to show journalists, uh, to, to show intelligence, and a lot of it is also destroyed. And the second question comes from Austin Gibbs, who says, Raleen, what can we as people in the diaspora do to keep the focus on hostages? And of course, this is so very, very important. Keep on talking about them. We now have this window of opportunity with the elimination of Sinwa, who was a major obstacle to get our hostages back. Keep talking about them. Keep wearing your yellow ribbons, your dog tags. Keep sharing their stories. Keep reminding the world that there are still 101 hostages of multiple faiths from many different countries who are held by a terrorist organization. Continue to be the voice of our hostages out to the world. That is the greatest thing you can do for us. And keep, because I know you guys are people of faith, keep saying those prayers. So that brings me to the end of today's edition of the Israel Brief. Guys, don't forget to check out our website at www.layoftheland.online, our YouTube channel at the Israel Brief right here. Click that red subscribe button. We are on Facebook at Lottel site. Join our community on LinkedIn at Rolene Marks, on Instagram at Rolene underscore Marks, on X at Lay of the Land 5. So guys, God bless you all. Take care of yourselves and each other. Chag Sukkot Sameach. And I will see you again tomorrow. Bye for now.